Okay, good. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Bill Flanoy. I'm the chair of the Economic Development and Employment Committee. Uh, the meeting is now called to order. It's being recorded for public access and archiving in accordance with the New York State open meeting law. It is the practice of CB2 to conduct remote meetings with all committee members, cameras on. Public attendees are also encouraged to leave their cameras on, particularly if you're given the floor to speak. All attendees, please keep your microphone muted when you're not speaking. To maintain appropriate discussion and voting process, I will make it known when and which topics are open for comment by committee members, board members at large, and the general public. If you have a question that falls outside of the public comment time, please type your questions in the chat panel and we'll address them as the time permits. You may also email the district office at any time outside of meetings. We are committed to pro providing access for all our neighbors regardless of physical ability or limitations. If you require accommodation or assistance for full participation, please contact the district office 72 hours before any public meeting. Okay, uh, Taya, the, the committee secretary will now conduct roll call. Hey all, uh, starting with Chair Bill Flanoy. Uh, I'm here. Vice Chair Denise Peterson. Uh, I do not see her. Secretary Catherine Gelman, that's me. New member, Amir Abu Akil. Yeah, I'm here. Amir, did I pronounce that correctly? You did, thank okay. you. Perfect. Uh, new member, Carrie Bailey. Sorry. Yeah. Kari, Kari. <laughs> Classic. I knew it. I knew one of the two. I'm sure I would get wrong. Kari Bailey, Amir Abu Akil, welcome you both. Maisha Morales. Here. Yeah. Great. Thanks for being here, Maisha. Latrell Masso. Here. Yeah. Hey, Latrell. And Ciro Scala. Here. And Kate Yearwood Young. Uh, she may be a little late. Uh, so she should be attending. She did uh, email me. Okay, that is roll. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, uh, let's see now. Uh, the adoption of agenda. Do we have any uh, anyone opposing the agenda as it stands? Okay, hearing none, we'll go forward. Okay, today we're doing a presentation. Oh, uh, do we have anyone who has any questions or concerns about the minutes uh, that... Uh, Kate Gilman actually uh, gave us uh, for last month. Okay, if there's any corrections or concerns, uh, please email the board office. And with that, we'll go to item number five on the agenda, presentation and public Q&A, uh, fund for the city of New York, uh, sanitation and clean curbs in Brooklyn County, uh, Community Board District 2. Okay, uh, Jed Hig Higdon, is that correct? Yeah, that's right. Okay, uh, the floor is now yours, sir. Illinois? Yes. Um, just before we get started with Mr. Higdon's presentation, I wonder if we could introduce the representatives from the bids that are present with us tonight, because so much of Jed's work was based on conversations with these good people. By all means, yes. Uh, Taya, could you, I see now, I'll start with as I see you, okay? Uh, Tamara Greenfield, I see you up first. Sure. Hi, I'm Tamar Greenfield. I'm uh, I started in November as the VP of Public Space and Operations, and um, from the Downtown Brooklyn Partnership. Sorry, <laughs> and I look forward to the conversation. Okay. Next, I see uh, Calvis. Hi. Good evening. My name is Calvis Micklesteins. I'm with the uh, Dumbo Bid. I'm the uh, Director of Operations and Planning. And uh, yeah, excited to hear what uh, Jed has to tell us and for the conversation. Great, thank you. Okay, next I see Leah Passman. Hi, I'm Leila. I'm the Community Engagement Coordinator for the Atlantic Avenue bid. Very excited to be here. Just a quick announcement. We're having an open street event on Saturday. It's a dance class for families. If you have, if you want to come or bring your family, it's going to be at 1230 on Hoyt Street in between State and Atlantic on Saturday. And we're going to be learning about different cultures through dance. And we worked with Jed earlier, and we're very excited for the presentation. All right, thank you. OK, and let's see now. Are there any other bid members here? Jay, do you see any other bid members that I, I do not recognize? I don't. I was distracted by Dumbo Bid's new website. Sorry. 
Congrats on that. Nope, everybody's here. Okay, perfect. Okay, with that, okay, we'll go back. We have a new bit. We have a new website too. <laughs> oh, oh promote, promote. <laughs> yeah, Downtown Brooklyn Partnership. We just launched an uh, an update, so it's it's pretty. <laughs> awesome. That's what I like to hear. Okay, uh, Jen. It is. It moves. That's amazing. <laughs> I love this place. Okay, Jed, uh, the floor is now yours. All right, thank you. Okay, so hi everyone, my name is Jed. I'll be presenting my project on sanitation and clean curbs, which is a program that I'll be talking about a little bit within the community district. Um, but before I get started on the project, I'll just introduce myself a little bit more. I'm originally from North Carolina. I went to UNC Chapel Hill. Um, and then about two years ago, moved to New York in order to attend NYU Wagner, where I studied urban planning. Um, since being in New York, I've worked in data analysis, community outreach, and then last summer, I worked for NYCHA on a research project that had to do with the use of food waste at NYCHA developments. Um, I was paired with Brooklyn Community District 2 through the Fund for the City of New York's Community Planning Fellowship. Um, FCNY is a nonprofit that supports other New York City nonprofits with no interest loans. They also run award programs for public servants, and then they also run the Community Planning Fellowship, which I participated in. Um, this program pairs graduate students with community districts where they work on a project that is both interesting to the student while also uh, useful for the district. Uh, and I was really excited to be paired with uh, District 2 because I'm interested in sanitation, but also I'm a resident of the district. So it was nice to work in an area that I knew. Um, and with that, I'll jump right into the project. Um, and the problem that I was looking to address has to do with the fact that uh, trash is stored in our sidewalks in most of the district and also the city. Um, and this leads to a bunch of other problems. We're all familiar with the rats that it attracts, but there are other pests like roaches, raccoons, and mice that come from this. They're especially attracted to food waste and waste, but you know, all waste attracts rats. Um, also, there's an issue of mobility and sidewalk space. Um, all of these images are from inside of the district somewhere. The top left image is in Dumbo, and there's so much trash on the sidewalk that I could barely fit between the trash and the building. Anyone in a wheelchair or anyone pushing a stroller would not have been able uh, to use this sidewalk, and that's a big problem. Uh, and then there's also obviously an issue with odor. It's starting to get warmer right now, so we all you know, can kind of smell these images when it's hot out, um, what this smells like. It's not pleasant. And all of these problems, again, lead to more problems. We're at the Economic Development Committee meeting, and no one wants to shop where they have to wade through piles of garbage. I'm sure tourists don't want to spend time in these areas, so um, it's a big problem. And with that, I'm going to uh, move on and start talking about some of the existing conditions analysis around these problems that I did in the district. And so up first, I have a heat map of rats in the district, and I'll uh, just point out, oh, excuse me, I'll just point out that uh, this is not, you know, an actual map of where the rats are. No one's outside counting the rats and pointing out where they live, but this is more of a general idea of where there are rat problems. Um, and so the data sources I use to make this are three-on-one calls. So when people call three-on-one about there being rats in an area, and then also DOHMH uh, inspections where there were failed inspections, meaning there were signs of rats or actually rats in an area. And from this heat map, we can see a few clusters that really stick out. Uh, there's one on Atlantic Avenue, Bergen Street, Livingston Street, and Myrtle Avenue. And all of these clusters share a character that they are commercial and have a lot of restaurants. Um, the only exception is Myrtle Avenue, as uh, some of the hotspot sort of extends into residential areas. But for the most part, it's not surprising there are a lot of rats outside of areas with lots of re uh, restaurants. And so next, I looked at trash problems, similar analysis. This is a heat map of the district. And you'll notice that there's sort of a blue haze over the entire district. And to me, that suggests that trash problems are more evenly spread out. And that kind of makes sense. People are going to call three on one with trash problems when it's right outside of their apartment and people live throughout the district. Um, despite that, there were still a few um, hotspots that I did identify, which are Fleet Place, Bond Street, and Third Avenue. And these are different from the rat hotspots and that they're not necessarily all commercial or all residential. They're a little bit more mixed use and a little bit different. So again, that drives home the idea that trash problems are more evenly spread out among uh, the entire district, not really in one particular area. And so next, I combine both of these uh, analyses to find out where there are rat and trash problems. And we see some familiar clusters. There's Atlantic Avenue, Bergen Street, Livingston Street, and Myrtle Avenue again, which all came up in the rat analysis. And there's one new cluster on Fulton Street. Um, and this comes out because there's probably, you know, a good amount of rat problems there, a good amount of trash problems there. It wasn't a cluster in either of them, but when you combine the data, it is uh, in this case. 
So to me, these represent uh, good areas in the district for interventions to try to improve the situation uh, based on data. And so now I'll just sort of talk about an overview of the project that I did. Um, it all started with the problems we talked about, rats, mobility, and stench. And then that leads us to a, pot a potential solution, which is waste containerization. Waste containerization, just to define it, is sort of going from this top image on the slide of you know, a big pile of messy commercial trash outside into the bottom image, which is a container within the district. Um, I will note that the top image, uh, all of that trash is not fitting in this bin in the bottom image. So that leads to uh, one of the potential problems with containers is whether or not they're big enough. Um, but with that being said, there is a program from DSNY and DOT called Clean Curbs that allows uh, commercial containerization throughout the city. Uh, clean Curbs is expensive though to implement and also the operations can be a little bit complicated. Um, as well as just the uh, implementation of it. So siting um, and fitting within all the compliance for DSMY and DOT. And so really the idea for this project was to talk to the pilots in the district and also the interested parties in the district and get a good picture of what's working, what's not working and how could um, different parties be supported moving forward with this program. So Clean Curbs, as I said, is a program in partnership between DSMY and DOT. And the idea is to go from this image we have here, a pile of garbage or an area where garbage tends to accumulate and use um, on what's on the second image, a container that allows the garbage to be in an environment that is rat proof, hopefully odor proof, at least to a point, and also um, better for mobility because the, you know, the trash bags aren't covering the entire sidewalk, they're confined to one area. Both DSNY and DOT have requirements for this program. DSNY is more interested in the type of waste and the amount of waste that's being produced um, for each of these to make sure you have the right size container because it's not very useful if you're just setting trash next to the container because it's always full. DOT is more interested in the mobility side. So they don't want to have the same problem and have a giant container that takes up the entire sidewalk. So there's still no way for people in wheelchairs or with strollers to get by. They also don't want them to be sited in active travel lanes, which makes sense. So whether that's a car lane or a bike lane, they can't be sited on the street unless it's in um, an open street or in a former parking space, which again is tough, especially in these commercial areas to take away parking. Um, so in most cases, these are sited on the sidewalk, but they are sited in the street in some cases as well. So in the past, most of these uh, clean curves pilot projects have been uh, completed within business improvement districts. And there used to be DSNY grants up to $20,000 per bid in order to implement this, uh, but those grants have since expired. So uh, DSNY seems like they'd like to be able to offer that again, but I, you know, I wouldn't rely on that. And I think that uh, future Clean Curbs projects will have to be funded uh, with some other source of money rather than these grants. Um, and then lastly, as these pilot projects are implemented, they are closely monitored to see how they're working. And I will um, show this next image is in Times Square Alliance. It's the second pilot in the city. This is a really uh, dirty uh, container. You can see it's broken. The latches are broken on the bottom. It's leaking. Um, and it just looks really nasty. And there were reports that it smelled really bad. That's why it's a pilot project, though. Uh, the containers that are being used or were being used in Times Square Alliance at the time have been iterated. They're stronger now. They're bigger now. They have better latches. And uh, scenes like this uh, I have not seen in the past few months. So uh, just keep in mind, though, that it is a pilot project. So, you know, things change over time. But this is sort of what it started as and then it's moved on to be uh, more effective. So by now you've probably recognized this same sort of bin that I've seen on most of the slides. This is from a company called City Bin. They're a Brooklyn-based company. They originally focused on bins for residential waste, like outside of someone's home, um, but they've shifted in order to address this uh, desire for containerization for more commercial applications in the city. Um, and so far within Clean Curb, the Clean Curbs program, they're the most commonly used container. I haven't seen any other containers being used. Um, there might be in some cases, but for the most part, uh, bids choose to go with city bin and that's easy because they're module based and expandable so you can see this image is from Montague Street bid um, it's a four module container and you could add a fifth module or remove one of these to make it a three module container pretty easily um, which is why it's helpful in cases where you might not know how much space you actually need you can increase or decrease as needed and then to give a rough idea of how much these cost for a two module system it might cost around three thousand dollars a four module system might cost around seven thousand dollars and then there would be additional costs for um, installation if you rely on city bin to do that. And also in this case, there are planters on the side um, that also would cost extra. And I'll just emphasize, emphasize that this is a rough cost estimate. I'm sure it's gonna be different in all different cases. So it could be more or less depending on the exact case. 
All right, so going back to maps for a little bit now, I wanted to show where there are um, existing pilots with, through clean curbs within Brooklyn Community District 2. And so in light, bit, in light blue, we see all of the business improvement districts and then highlighted in yellow are those that have clean curbs projects today. There are seven examples, um, three in Montague Street bid and four in downtown Brooklyn partnership. And they're being used by different parties. So Montague Street bid is using all of their containers for their own sanitation crews. So they're not being used by businesses but for the folks that clean up the bid, they put their trash in these containers that are then emptied by DSNY. In downtown Brooklyn partnership, two of their pilots are being used the same way, but two of them are being used by restaurants, which in my opinion is uh, much more impactful um, just because the restaurant waste is what tends to attract the rats, create the odor and really lead to all these other problems we talked about. In downtown Brooklyn partnership, there's one being used by Fulton Hot Dog King and one being used by Kappa. So this big chart is a list of all of the business improvement districts that I talked to, um, whether or not they have a clean curbs pilot as represented, the green ones do, the red ones do not. And then just a brief summary of my findings. And so I'll go through this chart uh, quickly, but I'll also say there is an accompanying report with this. So if you wanna look at a certain bid, um, it's, you, there's much more information there. Starting with Montague Street bid, um, they do have a clean curbs pilot, as I talked about. They were actually the first bid in the city to have a pilot before Times Square Alliance. Um, and so far, there's largely positive feedback from them. Uh, they have plans to expand in the future, whether or not that's for their own use or for restaurant use, I'm not sure, but you know, generally speaking, they're uh, pleased with the program. Downtown Brooklyn Partnership also has a clean curbs pilot. And for them, the main issue is that the containers are too small. Um, they're you know, located in a very intense commercial district. There's a lot of waste. Um, and I've seen in my own experience walking past the container that's used by Kava, Sometimes there's trash overflowing. They have to set trash next to the container because it's not large enough. Um, so for them, they really just need larger containers if they're going to go forward with any future iterations of this program. Um, all the rest of the bids in the district do not have pilots yet, but I'll start with Dumbo. Um, in my conversations and walk through with staff from Dumbo, um, they mentioned they might be interested in this in some cases, but for them, siding could be a concern. They've got some narrow streets and narrow sidewalks, and there isn't always a great place to put a big container like this. Uh, but we did find a few spots that might work. Um, there was one place where some businesses are using some non-secure plastic containers that rats can still chew through and access, but replacing those with uh, containers like we see in this uh, proposal um, could be possible. Moving on to Atlantic Avenue, as we saw, they came up as one of the areas that had um, a big problem with rats and trash. And that seemed to be the case also when I talked to staff from Atlantic Avenue, they identified actually the same place that the data identified, which is validating um, and so they're interested in implementing this, but for them, staff hours is a concern. They have a lot of things to juggle right now, and they don't have a lot of staff to put towards siting, outreach, making sure you're compliant, crafting application, working with DSNY and DOT. So for them, that's the real concern for this. When I talk to Fab Alliance, they have a few specific problem areas they'd love to implement this, especially for their own use. They have some public plazas that are often dirty, and it could be useful to be able to collect the trash there and put it directly into a secure container. But funding is a main concern for them. They don't have a ton of money to work with. Um, so it could be difficult to fund something like this. Um, moving on to North Flatbush, they were actually the least enthusiastic about this program. Um, they didn't seem like they, uh, representatives from North Flatbush did not have, you know, any major areas of um, uh, rat and trash problems within the district. However, um, they do have wide sidewalks and wide streets, so it seems like a good place where it could physically work. But uh, their wide sidewalks actually have a lot of subway grates, in which case you can't put permanent street furniture on top of the grates. And then some of their parking lanes become travel lanes for event traffic, especially at Barclays Center. Um, so it'd be difficult to site anything in the street either because the parking lane becomes a travel lane and then the container can't be there. And then lastly, I did get to speak to someone from Myrtle Avenue briefly, but they're going through a leadership transition. So I didn't get to have a solid conversation about this. Um, I will just say that they did come up again in the analysis that I did on rat and trash problems. So it might be, you know, something to consider going forward um, to look at containerization for those areas that have problems outside of restaurants, especially. All right, so based on my conversations and the data that I gathered, I found 12 sites in the district that I think would be smart um, places to put containers. Right. They're not, some of these come from conversations with the uh, bid staff, some of them come just out of the data, and some of them like that in Atlantic Avenue come from both, which uh, make even a stronger case for implementation. I tried to put at least one container in all of the bids, except for uh, North Flatbush here. Um, and 
I think that all of these sort of represent like the low hanging fruit, all these locations, the places that have problems today, have space today and could be implemented given the right funding. And then as a reminder, these are those same pilot uh, potential locations. <clears throat> and you can see that they address many of the uh, areas that have rat and trash problems, those dark purple areas. And those areas that aren't addressed are outside of business improvement districts. So they have to be funded and managed by some other party, whether it's a business that just wants to fund it themselves or someone else. So based on all of this analysis, I came up with two really uh, key recommendations. The first one is for business improvement districts, and I think that they should pursue clean curves containerization and focus in on restaurants when they do so. Um, some of the restaurants or areas that have problems weren't identified in my data just because the data is flawed. It's never going to be perfect. So bid staff and locals definitely know the areas that have problems the most, and I think that uh, restaurants within those areas would be great places to target. And then a recommendation I have for the community board is to include containerization for the key areas I identified, as well as any others that bids identify as a fiscal year 2025 CD needs budget request. And this takes the burden off of the bids to try to fund this or find some outside funding for this and makes the city fund it themselves. Um, as long as the uh, site is compliant, this should work as a uh, CD needs budget request item. And before I close, I just want to talk about the deliverables I made for this project um, so everyone knows about them. Uh, first, I did make a written report. It's like 60 pages long. I don't expect anyone to read all of it, uh, but if you want to, it is going to be accessible in the public drive and you can skim through it and see if there's anything that's interesting to you. <clears throat> Second, I did make an interactive map, and that's also linked in the report. I find that whenever I make these static map images, people always want to zoom in on their house or wherever they work. And so these maps allow you to do that. You can click around in the data and see exactly what kind of um, you know, what kind of rat problems there are right outside your door. And then lastly, uh, public presentation, which I've given now. I want to thank you all uh, for being here. I appreciate it a lot. And with that, uh, let me know if you have any questions. And you can contact me on my email or on LinkedIn. Thanks. Hey, thank you very much, Jed. Um, could you bring down your presentation? Stop sharing, please. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Joe. That was very informative. And as a matter of fact, in this district, we have a huge rat problem, okay, because of all the construction and everything else that's going on. So um, let me ask you a couple of questions here. I'm going to open up to the committee also and also to the bids. You're here also. I want you also to participate, okay? So I'm leaving it open to everyone. Um, let me ask you a question. How frequent are this DSNA uh, actually come around to dispose of the, the bins? Actually, do you have an idea on how often that is? How often they empty the bins? Yes, how often they empty the bins? Yeah, it varies. Um, they pick up residential trash you know, frequently, daily, in some places. Um, for the like public litter baskets, they empty, empty that uh, on different schedules, depending on the commercial district it's in. Um, and then I'm not sure about the, um, like the clean curves containers that are used by bids. <clears throat> I'm not sure how often those get emptied, but... I know in downtown Brooklyn, they mentioned that they have to be emptied frequently just because there's so much volume there. That's what I was about to ask also, because what I'm seeing also, and you mentioned it already, some of these bins have overflow and they're piling the bags next to the bins. Mm -hmm. Okay, right. so that, that's a big concern of mine because what's the point of having bins if in fact they cannot, you know, actually handle all of the trash that's necessarily be take, taken care of. Right. Okay. Yeah, part, part of the uh, clean curves application, they require you to estimate how much garbage volume you're getting each day. And so especially if you're working with like a restaurant, they should be able to know that amount and you should always, you know, have an extra module or two, depending on what it is. But I agree, there's no point in having it if it's just going to be overfilled every single day. So, yeah. And the next question I'm going to ask you, down here also, I've noticed residential trash. Okay. That piles up and you've also shown uh, images of that where it piles up on the streets. Is there anything we can do about residential trash also with these bins, or is that something that's not something they would work with? Right. So the whole Clean Curbs program uh, today is just commercial. It doesn't touch on residential. Um, they had one small pilot in uh, near Times Square, I think in Hell's Kitchen, um, focused on a slightly different container that's larger and designed for residential trash. But the commissioner of DSNY basically said that it's not going to work. It's never going to be big enough. Um, and so they're going to have to use a different solution for residential trash. Uh, my my building that I live in in the district has containers outside, and I know some other buildings do, and that seems to work pretty well because the the trash is only on the sidewalk for like an hour or two before it's picked up. 
Um, but, you know, I think the volumes of residential trash is going to have to be different solutions than just these containers, most likely. Are these bins actually mobile or are they fixed? These are fixed. Fixed. Okay. Uh, Cyril, I see your hand up. I'll start with you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Jed, for that uh, really in-depth uh, presentation. And I would say, I'll echo the chairman, a very, very important subject for our community. I had a question about uh, the bids being able or be financed. Most of them you had mentioned were may, fi may be financially uh, strapped to go ahead and invest in these bins. I was wondering if there would be a way that they would um, be given, maybe the individual uh, restaurants or commercial properties be given tax incentives from the city if they were if they were putting these bins in. I know if you're a commercial uh, business, you pay, you bought you get your own private uh, sanitation, you pay for that. But if they could get some recourse from the city because they're doing this themselves. Would that be an incentive for them or the bids to go ahead and uh, uh, institute these um, these bins? Yeah, uh, that sounds like a great idea. Uh, anything to get businesses to be able to invest in this themselves would be awesome. Whether or not that's going to happen, I don't know. Um, I know that DSNY people have expressed interest in doing these grants again that they've done in the past, but really there's there's no guarantee of that money coming. Um, and so, you know, people want to do that, but whether or not it will actually happen, I'm not sure. My second question was, Mr. Chairman, was uh, I see Dumbo uh, said they don't have the space or the, the streets are too narrow. This may not be a very practical question, but is it possible for that bid to have a location where these bins can be? Do they have to be adjacent specifically to the to the commercial property? Maybe there's a short distance where the bid can use that for, for a few of the commercial properties where they could join in and put it somewhere else. Jed, if you don't mind, I can jump in. Yeah, yeah, can jump in. Yeah, one of the one of the thank you for your question. One of the main challenges from that perspective is the coordination with commercial waste haulers for uh, a private business. Um, if uh, numerous restaurants or retailers don't share the same waste hauler, there can be challenges uh, with access. You need to make sure each one can get into the bin. Um, there's also huge challenges coordinating waste pickup when you, you know, as I understand it, you make an agreement with a commercial waste hauler, you've set a location for it to be picked up. Um, and then even if there's like a small inconvenience, like some construction happening and your site isn't exactly as it is, and you've moved your bags, you know, a little, a little ways down the block, your commercial hauler might come by and take a look and, and not see your waste and just not pick it up, even though it's, you know, it's, it's right there. So it's, uh, I'm not trying to say that it's something you can't do, but it's a, it's a huge coordination effort to get uh, everybody on board for something like this, um, especially in a neighborhood like Dumbo, where there's a huge mixture of the drop sites where there's commercial waste and residential waste. Uh, it, it, it takes a, a mountain of coordination. Chad and I talked about this uh, to great lengths, and we're still uh, looking at some opportunities to try to get something like this in place. But thanks for your question. Thank you, Phyllis. I definitely need to hear that also. Okay. Um, Amir, I see your hand raised. Thanks, Bill. Hey, this is a great presentation, Jed. A lot of de detail in here. So I'm thankful for that. Two quick questions. Um, first, is this, this is for my own edification. Is this, I guess, the pilot program that's part of the, the larger project that's been talked about in the news for the last month or so to replace like 150,000 parking spots with, with these containerized uh, trash cans? Or is this a separate uh, program altogether? I haven't heard that. It might be, but um, yeah. I don't think there's anything concrete going that that's, way. Yet. That's fine. That's fine. Yeah. That, that helps me with that. And then the second one is when you're doing the analysis on the trash, did you, and it may have been outside of the scope of your work, what, was there any comparison like to like pre-pandemic, like open restaurants, if that had any effect on it, or if there was um, um, some effect from 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 the change in eating patterns post uh, pre-pandemic and post-pandemic? Yeah, that's, that's a great question and very interesting. It was outside the scope. Um, I will say for the data I used, I used data from 2020, 2021, 2022, and then up until April, 2023. So that's all the rat and trash data that we used um, was from those dates. So it would have included the pandemic, but I didn't analyze like trends over time. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Good question, Samir. Uh, bye, Isha. Somewhere else? Yes, hi. Uh, thank you for a great presentation. 
uh, Ciro asked a question uh, that I was gonna ask, but in addition to that, I'm wondering, so it seems like there's just one manufacturing company of these bins, am I correct on that? And if so, so yeah. yeah, if so, as I'm, I'm hearing about, you know, some people with the, the bids can't afford it or what city incentives can be given, uh, but what about actually negotiate? Is there room for negotiation with the manufacturing company themselves? Mm -hmm. Because um, whether it be the bid or or businesses themselves or the city spending tax dollars, uh, they being the only manufacturing company that the city's doing business with, is there room to, as the demands increase, to get better pricing? Is that a conversation the city's having? Yeah, so um, if you do take a look at the report, I did actually get to talk to the city bin folks, the founder and the um, and some other people high up at the company. Um, and they actually are very interested in doing deals, um, especially for bulk orders. Um, they they're you know they're a local business. Um, they don't do a ton of business like you know nationally. So they have expressed interest. And if there were to be like an order for you know all the bids in Brooklyn too, they'd be able to drive the cost down um, in that way. And they're really interested in doing that. Uh, they would love to do it citywide, you know, and put in a million of these, um, and the cost per unit would be lower. Um, and so. Whether or not that's feasible or something that will happen from the city side, I'm not sure, but I think it's a good idea and they're definitely interested. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Jet, let me follow up, I'll piggyback off that. Uh, is it a possibility, you're saying they have to be purchased, is it a possibility they could be actually rented? Um, that's definitely a question to bring up with the city bin folks. Uh, they have mentioned in the past that they, uh, in certain cases, will do like a buyback. So if, for example, they have a container somewhere that's too small, they'll buy that one back and replace it with a larger one at that cost. Um, if that makes sense. So they, they are flexible. Um, I don't know if a rental is something they're interested in doing, but maybe, yeah. Okay, yeah because that would make it easier for some of the bids to actually set these items, the bins up, mm -hmm. set them out, see how they work. And if they right. work, order more. Right. Okay. Uh, let's see now. Uh, I'm going to go to Carrie. You had your, you actually put something in the chat. You can actually share. Hi, yes, Kari. Um, yeah, I was just curious, did you look, when you were researching, did you look into anything about like a sense of how long trash was sitting at the curb? Yeah, so a little bit. Um, the rules on that actually changed while I was doing this project. Um, you used to be able to put your trash out earlier. I don't remember the exact time, um, but now you have to set it out after 8 p.m., I think. Um, and so the idea is to get it as late as possible. And whether or not that's actually followed is another question. Uh, you know, sometimes trash just gets put out early. Um, but the official rules from DSNY are that it has to be out pretty late at night and so that it gets picked up early in the morning. And so it's out for, you know, less than 12 hours if possible. Okay, thank you. Uh, Tamara, I see your hand raised. Thanks. Yeah, I just was going to say in, there was a few questions about, um, the appearance, which also came up in like how they fare. And our experience in downtown Brooklyn partnership is that they've been, um, they take a lot of damage on the street. I think it's different if it's in a residential frontage, like they, I think they can last a pretty long time, but we've already seen ours, you know, hit by trucks, um, be like grease stained and splattered with all sorts of stuff, which just does not come off. And so we're actually getting the wood paneling removed. And um, then they'll be, they're going to, DSNY is going to be putting on a protective wrap. So hopefully there'll be a little bit better appearance, but I still don't know how long these things are going to fare, frankly, um, just based on in terms of the scale of the need. They're just, they're not big enough. And in terms of what DSNY is looking at, I think they're looking at a whole systems change that um, I think we could do a few little ad hoc challenge, you know, issues, like try to address some specific corridor challenges, but ultimately I don't think they're gonna, sadly, I don't think they're gonna address the underlying challenges that we're looking at. Um, I would love, I, I definitely am all for containerization, but I think these are just a little bit too bespoke at this, at this point. 
and unless there's just like a specific business that you can get to do it and do it at a, a scale that's big enough, um, it's it's not going to address the big the big issues we have, unfortunately. It's just our experience. Uh, Tamara, for the downtown Brooklyn partnership, who's actually just uh, emptying out the bins? So we have two different systems at work. Basically, for we're using two sets of the bins for our own trash. So as the dough fund is, you know, just sweeping and cleaning and doing everything around, they'll take their trash that they're collecting and stored in there until it gets until we you know we haul our own trash to sanitation and we do that many times a day so we're basically filling them and emptying them many times a day and then for the businesses they are storing their trash the two businesses are storing their trash in there until their carter comes and so like kava will put as much trash as they can fill in there. And then if it spills over, they'll just pile it next to it. And then their carter picks it up directly from the, um, the bins. And for Hot Dog King, I think they've been a little bit better about not piling too much because they work later. And so I think they're pulling their trash out a little bit closer to the time that the you know that the their carter comes so it's it's generally just kind of it's helpful but it's not addressing the the full scale of the the need so the restaurants are they're the ones that handle their own bins and downtown Brooklyn Sh partnership handles theirs yep. and the purchases were made by the restaurants and the purchases for downtown Brooklyn partnership was made by no we purchased them all we found several businesses because we got the grant and then we asked if there were businesses that were open, like we've identified a few problematic areas and then talked to the businesses and got some buy-in and then were able to partner around those bins specifically. And they, they were enthusiastic. And we had a bunch of other sites, um, which I think Jed mentioned in the report that were rejected because it's not easy to find as much as this is a partnership with DOT and sanitation, DOT has not actually been super um, flexible <laughs> on where they're cited. And so we've, we've ended up not really getting too many on the actual street. Most of them are either in an open street kind of temporary closing. That's pretty much all of them are more or less connected to some other kind of street adaptation. Yes, thanks, Tamara. Uh, Kate, I see your hand raised. Hey, um, thank you for such a, a thoughtful presentation. We really appreciate it. Obviously, a lot to say on it. I have a few questions. Um, I'm wondering how this potentially, if it's answerable, how this ties into the 2024 commercial waste overhaul that's happening. Um, that's going to be across, you know, 20 zones. And I think how we, how the city or, or what you found in your research, how they're plan, plan, planning, excuse me, to tie in clean curbs into that effort, if they have, since we're mapping all this at a larger level anyway, right now, um, it's such an inefficient um, industry as it stands. And I know that we're going to be having some pretty sweeping changes in the next year. So I'm wondering how we can take advantage of that. And I I'm also just hearing the different bids kind of participate is so helpful here. I'm so glad you're all on this call. The hope that I would have is that we can kind of stoke some communication and, you know, larger buying power and larger negotiating power as a group, uh, because we all share these problems. And if this research, you know, in the short term shows us 10 hotspots that we can address with, you know, better, um, Kind of negotiations with city bin or an equivalent, or it has a meeting that we can coordinate with DSNY, you know, to whatever extent we can to tap into funding maybe we're not aware of. Like I know Taya mentioned in the chat, solar powered big bellies. Um, I know there's money out there for more sustainably driven solutions here um, that go maybe beyond the level that we're used to with trash collection. So I think I'm curious how we can all put our heads together and try to get more money on the table because bids are already strapped and doing a ton of our waste work. Um, 
So those are my, my two thoughts are just how can we tie this into the larger moving pieces in the, in the commercial waste overhaul? How can we take advantage as a group, um, kind of leveraging all of our bids together to, to be able to solve this in the next year or two while we wait for the, the bigger solutions to happen? Yeah, thank you for that. Um, and uh, I'll agree with your point and also with Tamara earlier. Um, I think this is you know, a potential solution for some low hanging fruit. And that's why I really focused on like some major problem areas, but probably isn't the long-term solution. There's gonna have to be a bigger solution and also different solutions. Nothing's gonna work for everywhere um, in the city. As far as how this uh, particular program plays into the larger commercial waste overhaul, I'm not sure. Um, I know that uh, uh, Commissioner Tish of DSNY did say that like the uh, residential pilot they did with, these con with a different type of container, but still containerization, that did not go well, but she mentioned in the same hearing that the commercial aspect for these does work in some cases, um, and it's throughout the city. So I think, you know, uh, targeting these hotspots, this is something that can be implemented fairly quickly and at a re reasonably low cost, um, I think is a good opportunity in the short term. But then again, I'm not sure how it plays into the longer um, complete change uh, throughout the city. And then you also asked about other sources of funding. And I think there is, you know, there are options out there. Um, probably people who have bids know better than I, though. Um, I know when I was talking to North Flatbush, they they do a lot of outside fundraising for specific projects. So that could be an option for sure. Thank you. Thank you, Jed. I'm, I'm curious um, to the bid folks who are on this call, are there routes that you've found besides these grants that are effective kind of funding sources that we can all put in the pot together here? I think the on this kind of issue, the more information sharing, the better um, as far as how we get kind of containerization in the next year or two for the worst areas in front of these restaurants. Okay, let's, yeah, let's, yes, please go first. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I'll, I'll jump in. Uh, thanks for the question, Kate. Uh, I guess my comment was more about what you uh, you had brought up about the new uh, commercial waste zones that are going to be set up. Um, I hope that as they plan, having less haulers in each area would make it a lot easier to run something like a city bin uh, in a lot of areas, yet to be seen how that gets implemented. But, uh, you know, ideally that would kind of, you know, mitigate some of the challenges with having numerous uh, haulers and, and things like that. Um, but the other question about the the funding sources, I there's, re there's really not a lot out there. Um, and it speaks to what Tamara mentioned about how putting down the city bin is one thing, but um, just you know, maintaining it over the years, just like any other piece of infrastructure. You could say that about a planter on the street. You could say that about a city bin. You could say that about a bike rack. Getting the initial funding to, to put it down is great, but over the years, someone has to maintain something and, and keep it in good repair. So that's kind of the, the element. This isn't a program that is gonna function off of grants and uh, you know, short-term investments. It needs to be something that gets built into um, you know, built in a bid budgets if possible, but in general, from a, a citywide perspective, needs to be considered a lot more intensely by by sanitation for sure. Okay, Tamara, do you have anything you want to add? Yeah, I mean, I think we're we're very open to continuing to try new approaches and, um, you know, in strategic locations, if we could find the right infrastructure, we would even potentially make the investment. <clears throat> um, just because there are some areas that have become that are so problematic, that it would ultimately save us a lot of labor in the long run, <laughs> but just to be able to come up with something better. But so far, and I've been I've been looking, looking, and I haven't found the right, you know, I, I don't think this, these particular city bins are the it and I haven't found yet the other solution, but I'm, I'd love to keep having the conversation with anyone else who wants to keep having it and think about what we could do creatively to really take on some, especially some of these really dense restaurant rows, um, because there's just the, the current strategy for how to deal with the trash is just, it's not, it's not effective. As far as the hotspots that he, that was discussed. Okay, Jed mentioned like 10 hotspots, I believe you mentioned, Jed? Uh, there were four major ones for rats and trash, but you know, the map displays a bunch. Yeah, there. And I, I had 12 uh, sites that I picked. 12 sites, I apologize. Yeah. Uh, Calvis, Tamara, did you coordinate with him about those hotspots in your bids? 
I don't think we did. No, right, Jen? That was more from your data analysis. Right, so they, it differed by district. So uh, Calvis, if you remember, the one on Old Fulton Street that's in front of a few restaurants, that was one that came through our walkthrough and conversation. Actually, the data didn't show any problems in Dumbo, which I know probably isn't the real case on the ground. Um, and then uh, I think all of the ones in downtown Brooklyn were data-based. So it just, it varies from site to site and that is broken down in the report uh, near the end. If anyone wants to know like why I picked each site. Um, and also like, there's no need to be married to these sites. They're just ones that I thought would make sense. But I think each bid you know, has their own, their own ideas as well. Uh, the reason I asked that is for the district statement of needs, we might want to know specifically what the hotspots are. Okay, so if you, if you can actually coordinate and let us know what you think they may be, definitely would appreciate it because okay. they are coming up, the district statement of needs. Okay, uh, Ciro, I see your hand raised. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as a question for Tamara, uh, I get the sense that you, if you had to do it over again, would you commit to do this pilot plan? Or uh, I get the sense that maybe it has not been as successful as you hoped for. Something like that in your voice. Uh, yeah, no. Let me, I know. Uh, I think we're, we're disappointed because we thought it might be I mean, I think there was a lot of excitement about trying it. And I think we, you know, it's like you set them up and you're like, wow, these are, you know, all of a sudden you see how fast they fill. They're just not at the scale we need. Um, so you're saying that you need larger ones or you, you, need, you need like a much bigger uh, presentation and larger uh, bins for your area? Is it, would that be one of the big improvements? Yes, I mean, that would definitely help. I think we def we certainly need ones that can be easily cleaned and kept secure um, and hold up a little better to being like, you know, beaten up on the street. Um, yeah, and, and I think like, you know, one of the things that we talked about in Jed, with Jed when we did our walkthrough was that if we really want to address rat issues in a specific zone, you have to have more consistent participation across all of, as many players as you can get. Having like one business here and one business over there um, is unlikely to really get at the, the, the deeper issue. You really, because rats are just gonna find wherever there's a weakness. So if we are gonna try to really get at infestation and you know, and, and the issues that arise from the outdoor trash, we have to pick like, you know, if there's five restaurants together, it's gotta be all of them as much as we can try, we've got to really get at that whole set to be able to do this in a real way, I think. I had one more question, Mr. Chairman, but about, this is a general question. Jed may be able to answer it. Have you explored the NYCHA buildings? Would 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 we be uh, helpful? Would the committee would be helpful in in having the NYCHA building? We have a few NYCHA uh, complexes in our community that uh, maybe would be a big plus for them to have that uh, those bins. I'm not sure this is this is uh, the kind of question that you even looked into, but uh, obviously they have everyone has rat problems, and I'm just wondering that they're big complexes. And maybe you can be some innovation there to help them out with that. Is that an issue that you'd have to work with the city with or DSNY, et cetera? Um, so I, I can address this. Um, I'll start by saying if you take a look back at the rat and trash maps, you'll notice that according to the data, there are no problems on the nitrous sites in the district, which obviously isn't true. I think that comes back to I used a lot of 311 data. And so some people are less likely to call 311. So they're not going to call 311 if they see a rat. On the development, it's just kind of par for the course, which I think is probably what's causing that. Um, and then not from this project, but from my past work with NYCHA last summer, um, I did work in the office where they're doing waste management, and they are planning an overhaul of the way that NYCHA as a whole does waste um, using containerized waste yards for all of the trash. Um, and so that's something that's changing slowly. Um, I don't know exactly what where they are with the sites in our district, but um, over time, all nitro trash is going to be like in a waste yard, containerized, closed. Um, and then I also did a, my project there was on food waste, um, looking at different ways to use it. Um, I was mostly focused on the sites that have urban farms, which there aren't any in our district, but there is uh, gardens nearby um, that could use food waste and composting. So 
Um, there's a lot going on there, um, but maybe not from this specific program. Okay, thank you, Jed. Thank uh, you. We're gonna follow up on those questions, trust me. Kate, I see your hand raised. You brought some interesting items also in the chat. I'm curious, um, yes, to the kind of NYSHA gap in the in the data, just because it's not gonna be 311 applicable and um, also yes to zero to thinking about just the amount of land that's on those development sites that if if things can be worked on creatively with mutual benefit, that, that that's something to really consider. I wonder, I mean, the city is is an incredible property owner, obviously, and um, like vastly underutilizes vacant lots and, and places throughout. I'm just curious how we can um, try to coordinate if the commercial kind of 20 zone remapping is going to involve any hubs or anything to that extent. I really want us to uh, as as CB2 and as a group of bids to try to fold in where we see kind of spots in, in our community. I wonder, I wonder, Jed, in your data and your, in your mapping, if we look at kind of vacancy and city-owned land on top of the um, grids that you're finding or, or on top of our district, just to be aware of where they are. And if we, even if this is a year or two year solution or something like that, um, just thinking about the spaces that aren't being taken advantage of as a city, and that are going to be used for things like charging, um, you know, electric car charging ports and things that the city is investing in as well. So trying to trying to think with a big kind of wide lens on how we can collaborate on space and on sustainable things that are already going to be folded in in the next two years. I really like what you're saying about obviously composting and urban farms. We there's There's a good number of them in Brooklyn, just not a lot in our district, but certainly ones that we can coordinate with. For, for green waste. I think that's a great idea with the vacant lots. And I think operations might be tough getting you know businesses to collaborate and put the waste in a certain place, but generally that's a great idea. Um, I didn't look at that for the research, but um, you know it's easy to find out where there are vacant lots. And you're kind of killing two birds with one stone because those vacant lots are also where rats tend to live when there's, if there's loose dirt and stuff, they'll all hole up there. And I'm sure we've all seen that before. But. Exactly. And the we have we have massive rezoning in Gowanus just south of us. There's a lot of kind of movement on lot development um, that I think is going to be for the next couple of years if we have a strategy that's both short-term, low-hanging fruit, long-term, you know, try to hit it out of the park and actually deal with garbage in New York. <laughs> um, it's going to be kind of two both at once, um, trying to figure out how we can live here and and create a better system for the long term. Yes, uh, you also brought something else up, Kate, that I thought was very interesting, the rat czar. We have a rat czar. Has the rat czar actually reached out to anyone? Jed, did you hear anything about that? I have not. I, I know about the rat czar uh, hire, but I've, you know, I've had no direct contact. Okay. I was just kind of curious about that because that would be a an interesting funding source if, in fact, they're interested in, in handling this. 100%. I think holding, there's been so much silly PR around this and the idea of them actually spending dollars towards this problem um, versus a position to talk about this problem with, I think, to, to try to take advantage of some of that. I'm sure she's funded. Tamara. <laughs> I was just going to say um, that one thing that I thought was interesting when we talked to sanitation earlier this year, um, they mentioned that they're going to start doing more enforcement with the businesses around food composting with the restaurant businesses. Um, Cause I don't, I think they, they sort of put it on hold for during the pandemic. And so it's something that I think probably certainly as bids, we should be doing more engagement and outreach to make sure that the businesses really understand what their requirements are. And I, I guess it's coming through the Department of Health inspections that they're getting that enforcement. I haven't heard of that happening yet, but it just might be another area where in terms of like for um, everyone's engagement, thinking about how to really um, encourage and support the businesses to be doing more of the kind of appropriate disposal of food so that it doesn't just get mixed into their regular trash. Um, it could make a big difference in the amount that is being generated. 
Uh, Jed, in your final report, were you taking into account all the issues that are being brought up right now? Um, some of them, some of them I wasn't aware of, but um, in some cases, yes. I was just going to echo, actually, one of my recommendations in the report that I didn't cover tonight had to do with waste separation, uh, which I'm a, I'm a huge fan of. I think it makes a lot of sense. Um, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but like close to a third of all the waste in New York is food waste. So you talk about, you know, decreasing the volume and putting it to use. It's, it's also a resource, you know, you can use it uh, in compost for farms. You can use it um, Newtown Creek uh, wastewater recovery facility has a huge anaerobic digester that can take food waste that creates biogas um, that's useful. So there's like, and also, uh, you know, food waste in landfills creates methane, which is a really bad um, greenhouse gas. So this is like a multi, uh, multiple issues here. Um, you know, one of one of the benefits to businesses, restaurants, if they choose to separate uh, their waste is they can pay less for hauling. Um, if they're taking out like half of their trash, putting it to a different use, they're not gonna have to pay to have that hauled away. Um, so that's another thing. Um, yeah, I, I agree with that tomorrow. Thank you for bringing that up. Okay, uh, Calvis, I see your hand raised again. Yeah, uh, just to jump in there, uh, as a reaction, Jed, one challenge about taking away compost, you're not going to eliminate the cost entirely. You're still going to have to pay someone potentially to take it away. It's not a, a free uh, a free disposal necessarily. But um, uh, I had heard recently talking about the new containerization BSNY pilot that uh, restaurants might have to get uh, containers and start to comply uh, entirely to a container program, as opposed to putting out their bags later if they don't have a container. Um, I have heard that's something DSNY is investigating. So uh, from a restaurant perspective, maybe not a, a whole city bin, but even just having your waste in a in a garbage can, uh, old school style, uh, you know, could make a change as well. Yeah, uh, one thing I'll add too is, um, as far as putting money towards this problem, the city did pay like $4 million to um, McKinsey. So they're, you know, they're paying consultants to look at the issue as well. Um, so there, there may be more solutions that come out of that. And I, I tend to agree with a lot of what's being said that there's not gonna be one solution that's perfect for the whole city. It's gonna be a bunch of different smaller solutions that combine to redo how we do waste here. Okay. Uh, yes, Kate. One well, promise it's my last. I'm curious. <laughs> I'm curious how we might be able to hold in a conversation with the Brooklyn Navy Yard, just given the scale of their site, um, including rooftop space, which includes a farm that I've worked with before, Brooklyn Grange. I think the, not to put like undue pressure on them, but as a manufacturing hub that's inside CB2, and they have plenty of new tech environmental kind of startup hub businesses there. I'm curious if there's anyone who's already in our district who's working towards kind of green waste um, efficiency processing or anything like that, that we can start to look at public-private partnership here with folks who are already invested kind of in CB2. And even just thinking um, with some of their space in mind um, and doing some kind of lease with them through, uh, whether it's through coordinated bids or through, you know, our district statement of needs kind of subsidizing an effort towards this if we have a planned location, but just flagging Brooklyn Navy Yard as a, as kind of our probably biggest, um, most applicable industrial zone with actually, I mean, how many 500 acres between the land and the water span across. It's pretty, it's pretty substantial and they're doing a lot of work all the time. Uh, Jed, we're just sure, uh, did you actually include the Brooklyn Navy Yard in your, in your research? So they weren't included as like a party I reached out to um, and they didn't really come up in data, but again, that's because the data is not perfect. So we don't know, you know, people aren't calling through anyone inside the, inside the Navy Yard, but um, I did not speak to them directly. You know. They're really easy to work with and they, and part, we partner a lot with them just in the course of this committee. Um, so we're happy to put everybody in touch to keep kind of thinking about solutions here. I know this is just the start of this convo, um, but they're doing all sort all kinds of interesting stuff there. They've got, last time we were there, we saw, you know, a self-driving car lot that's got, you know, large scale testing happening. They've got, they have a lot of um, kind of uh, sense of pioneering. Um, so I think if we're trying to, if we're trying to figure this out, that they'd be a great partner for us to lean, lean on. Yeah, excellent. Okay. Um, 
Tamara, thank you so much for joining. Okay, um, you're still here, so we can thank you. Uh, if you have any feedback uh, you want to uh, direct toward us, please, by all means, do so. Well, we would definitely appreciate it. Jed, I did not expect this, this discussion to continue as long as it did, okay? But obviously, there's a desire and a need for this and a solution for the problems we've been having here. So thank you so much. I, I have your uh, the entire report in front of me. I've gone through it once or twice. I'll go through it again based on the discussion that we just had, okay? Yeah, thank you. Thanks, everyone, for the discussion and for listening. Appreciate it. Hey, thank you, Jed. Congratulations, Jed. Good job. <laughs> good job, Jed. Did a really thank good you. job. Thank, thank you, you so much. Okay. Uh, everyone's welcome to continue to uh, remain at the meeting as we continue going forward. Um, the chairperson's report. Okay, that's item number six. Okay, now I've reached out to all the committee members, okay, except for the new, oh, you know what? I'll tell you what, um, before I do that, I wanna introduce the new committee members and by all means, uh, you can speak up, give us a little background about yourselves. Okay, uh, uh, Carrie, is that correct? I yeah, Carrie. Carrie, Carrie, okay, thank you. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Hi everyone, yeah, so I was actually on a previous, I was on a land use committee. Um, but this is my, I'm familiar with the board, um, but yeah, now I, I've i uh, worked at different city agencies. I actually now work for the Department of City Planning, um, but I've also worked for DOT and the Mayor's Office of Data Analytics, which is now called the Office of Technology and Innovation, OTI. Okay, thank you, welcome. Okay, and Amir. Please tell us a little bit about yourself also. Yeah, hello everyone. Um, name is Amir Boakil. I am a resident of Clinton Hill, so 11238. I've been in the area for about eight years uh, between North Slope, uh, downtown Brooklyn, and now Clinton Hill. Uh, previously worked in government, now in the financial sector up in Manhattan. Uh, I've got one, one kid, one on the way, and uh, joy in living here. So. Okay, thank you. Okay, welcome also. Okay, so uh, now to the chairperson's report. Um, what I've asked uh, all the committee members and uh, Car Carrie and Amir, I'm going I'm to really get it eventually correct. <laughs> okay, uh, what I've asked the committee members to give us uh, each individually one of the items that they want us to uh, explore as a committee going forward. Okay, so each person has something within that they actually feel very strongly about that we should address economic development and employment committee. So I've asked each one of the committee members to bring something to this committee so we can move forward starting next year, okay, and addressing that. Uh, Ciro, I see you have your hand raised first. Yeah, I, I, I thank you for that, uh, Bill. That was really interesting email. Uh, obviously, I'm interested in two areas. Uh, uh, the cannabis situation, uh, uh, I'm very interested in having our committee be very much involved in the process and in the enforcement and licensing as that goes forward and use our influence with the electeds to try to get that done and maybe uh, convince the wide community board that our committee should be the uh, the, the committee to go to. Uh, that's one of my favorite uh, issues. The other is, uh, of course, uh, employment and business development. Work. I think uh, Kate mentioned the Brooklyn Navy Yard has been a very intricate part of our, our work. And I, I still want to see us marry um, STEM schools, high schools, with jobs, trying to influence those two areas to have us be more influential in that area to get our young people to into professional jobs. So those are two areas I'm interested in. Okay, thank you, Cheryl. Okay, um, I'm going to go right down the line. Okay, uh, Denise, I know you're in another. Uh, you may not be available to speak right now. Did you mention me? Yes, I did. Hey, good evening, everyone. My apologies. I am uh, on two meetings. And um, so they see my lips moving. Hold on. I'm on a police comstat meeting. That's important um, in terms of some changes that they're seeking to make in the, in the confines of 
probably all the precincts I know within the 88. So I'm, I'm, I'm juggling both meetings. Uh, I hope everyone is well. And I know this is our last meeting for the year, but I think that we should try to stay connected on some initiatives uh, moving forward, uh, you know, by email, of course. And uh, we hope for, you know, a uh, uh, continued robust um, new year coming forth and, and starting out again in September and with some very, uh, very interesting um, initiatives and, and, present, and presenters. Thank you, Mr. Flanoy. And um, and the uh, and all of the members of this committee, and I look forward to resuming uh, and continuing the relationship and the work on behalf of the people. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Peterson. Uh, Kate Gilman. Hey, everybody. Um, I think something I'd like to take some leadership in and see us do similar to what happened tonight on this call. I think having the bids be a regular attendee and I'd be happy to um, coordinate some of that. I'm a new member this year of the Atlantic Avenue bid just by way of like conflict um, disclosure. But I think the for us, there's such a um, partner in an on the ground way within our district. And they can, they're really all de dealing with different versions of the same sanitation, lighting, beautification issues. And I think if we can um, have a better coordination with each of those heads uh, in a regular way, we can kind of turn that towards jobs, turn that towards their merchants, all the things that our committee is really charged with. Um, so I'd love to see that. And I'd love to take some ownership over that. And then also the kind of environmental and sustainable development within our district, um, especially. I think there's kind of a lot changing, obviously, over the last and in the next couple years uh, in Brooklyn. And I think uh, for us to have that kind of mapping layered on everything we're doing in CB2 to try to take advantage of grant money and development dollars and how we can um, kind of leverage better better living with our merchants. Um, like was said tonight, the even the sorting of organic waste and trying to help this not be a one-off um, situation for our restaurants, but to have a, a coordinated conversation with DSNY or with, you know, DOT or whoever we're dealing with. So bids and sustainability would be my, my kind of two. Okay, thank you, Kate. Okay, Mayesha, I see you have your hand raised. Yes. Hello, everyone. Um, something I'd like to see and would like to take a lead on and, and assist with is uh, so for those of you that don't know me outside of Community Board 2, I work for State Senator Jabari Brisport. And as I am working closely with the community from community centers to uh, TA presidents, uh, some of the things that keep coming up are employment, youth employment and younger adult, young adult employment and the struggles they're having. Uh, what's been brought to my attention is that a lot of the young people in the community, especially in NYCHA developments, would prefer for various reasons, they can only work within uh, the community, right? And they're, the youth centers and the TA presidents are having a hard time connecting them to jobs. So um, I would love to see, I think it would be great that young uh, community centers, anyone who works with youth and TA presidents maybe present to us, just kind of give us an update on what's going on, what they what they see is a struggle economically um, for for their constituents, and for us to be that bridge in connecting them to those companies and organizations that offer jobs. So um, I would like to uh, I I wouldn't mind leading that and connecting. I guess I would connect them with Taya or with you, Bill. I'm not too sure, but I wanted to yeah do that. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mary Asha. Uh, I'm gonna... Yes, this is he. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mary Asha, I just wanted to say, first, I think all minors should absolutely have access to good 
well-paying, safe jobs within walking distance of their homes. I think that's really important. Um, and I'm with you and I will connect with you offline because I've been thinking about um, other ways that we can use like some of our public digital assets to help because I, I think it's just, it, it's about being a knowledge pipeline because we are, the, the community districts are in a unique position of sort of getting this, this fire hose of information from all of the city agencies. Um, and I think that there's more that we could be doing when we are a we and not a me, um, but I definitely wanna to talk to you about that. Uh, and Ms. Gilman, asylum seekers, we did have a presentation here and that's something we should definitely address. Okay, uh, Kate, you're with Young. Okay, I know you're maybe have your hands full, but can you speak? Okay, uh, if you get the opportunity, please come forward. Okay, uh, let's see now, Latrell, are you still here? Where else am I gonna be? Okay, by all means, what do you have for us also? Um, I agree with um, Aisha about getting into the community. I can tell a story when I was younger, some of you, two stories ago, when I was younger. Latrell, could you speak up a little bit? I, I can barely hear you. I have some noise going on outside, I'm, I apologize. Um, when I was younger, I remember um, I went to school in a different borough, but my mom didn't feel safe in me traveling. So she went at the time before, and there's a halfway house, but before it was a daycare. And my mom went across the street and she wanted for me to stay in the neighborhood. And I think that's very important what Maisha said about the kids to stay close to home. Because I know like a lot of times at the church at the Open Door when, for the summer program, our pastor would hire the kids in the church for the summer some of the sub youth workers would come from outside of the community. So I think it's important to make sure we try to show the kids to stay close to home. And I know for me, when I was 14, I didn't want to travel to the Bronx on a train by myself. I'll be honest. And I think we should get in the community. And I would love to team up, team up with um, Ms. Denise to do the um, job fair. And instead of us being always on um, the on Zoom like, to get out in the community and really see what the community needs and wants. And like everybody don't come to the health, I mean, come to the um, economic development meetings, but this is to get out in the community and talk to them and see what they want and what we can do to help support them. Hey, thank you, Latrell. Okay, I see a mirror, we've lost a mirror. Okay, so, uh, Carrie? <laughs> okay. Do you have anything you want to say? Um, people are stating priorities or things to think about for the uh, summer committed. break, right? Yes, in general. Hmm. I do not know. I don't have any well, thoughts at the moment. Okay, well, give it a thought, okay? And, you know, you have an idea based on what the committee members are stating. By all means, feel free to send a text to uh, the board office. Okay. Okay. Amir, I see you're, you're back. Do you have anything that you might also suggest for the committee to focus on? I don't have anything on top of my head right now. Uh, I think we're on the spot, but I, I mean, a lot of the suggestions have been brought up around employment. Uh, youth employment is pretty important to me. Um, uh, I, but I, I will, I will have other I, other opinions here in the coming months. Okay. Thank you very much. Bill, can I say something, please? Sure, by all means, Denise. I just want to quickly just say that, too, uh, I, I think we, for those who've been on the committee a long time, know the community uh, for uh, which we serve in CB2. But I also think that uh, for those who don't know the community, it's it's not just my community. It's the, the, there needs to be some familiarity. Um, or some sort of information that's provided to all the members uh, if we can have uh, such a document that tells us what's within community board two, how many housing developments, what the numbers are in those developments. I think that kind of information will give us a broader view of how we can begin to come up with some ideas, what the statistics are, statistics of low for employment, 
and some other information that can help us. It could be a guide for us. Um, I mean, I know all parts of of the community we serve, but but yeah, um, I think that information can be helpful to to those who are not through and through uh, with that information, um, so they'll know that the community is made up of, you know, it's a gentrified uh, community on one end and on two ends and on three ends, but they're also people who are in need of employment, people who have always had high employment numbers uh, to their disadvantage, of course, and, and all the other perhaps important things that can give them perspective about the community, the interests of the communities as we seek to understand what we should do for the community. We have to know who makes up the community, i.e. community board too. So perhaps I'm not giving more work to, to tell you, but let's, uh, let's see what we can get. I think that would be great. Hey, thank you, Denise. Okay, uh, Ms. Yearwood Young, are you back? Okay, uh, I'll get back to you later. Okay, so with that. Sorry, I, I am here. Um, I've been listening intently. Um, it's a little bit of a chaotic scene. Um, I mean, I, I, in terms of, you know, the ongoing work of the committee, um, you know, we've we talked about a, an employment and resource fair for a long time. Um, I'd really love for something like that to happen, particularly, and as people have already talked about, directed um, for young people and NYCHA residents and people who are really um, looking for that work. So that's something I'd love to be more involved in and, and help spearhead in the year ahead. Now that COVID hopefully is you have to a point where we can hold it in person and really get this done. All right, thank you, Kate. Okay. Are we hear you? Can you mute yourself? Can you hear the uh, background? Deputy Inspector. Um, okay. So with that, we'll go to other committee business. Is there any other committee business that uh, we want to discuss? Okay. Okay, here we go. No, I just put something in the chat. I had a, I was gonna ask Denise what she meant by um, looking at more information about the community. She was talking about employment numbers or I wasn't sure what she meant by that. Uh, I don't see Denise right now here, but one of the things that, uh, Taya, could you address that? Because we have uh, information uh, that uh, is dispersed throughout the community. Uh, I understood the first part. I didn't understand the second part. Can you repeat your question, Bill? Oh, yes. Uh, we have a, a resource. Anytime anything occurs within the district, okay, we actually have the ability to disperse it. Um, and this, uh, our district manager actually has the ability to actually uh, have resources to allow other people to have access to them. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, period. Um, I, maybe I can pull some threads together. Uh, darn that Denise isn't here. So I was looking through, I in my non-existent free time, I like to poke through all of the old archive files that are lying around at the office, physical files and digital files. And I'm realizing that they're there hasn't been, once upon a time, like 20 years ago, 20 years ago, the Mayor's Office of Community Affairs, CAU, put together a citywide board member's guidebook, like handbook. Um, it's never been updated and CB2 has never had its own. So I'm working on one. It's gonna have some of the components that Denise was asking for. Um, and Kari, I'm so glad you found that page on your own. Um, I've been sharing that widely with the board members for some time now because um, it'll the guidebook's definitely going to expand on some of those resources too. So twofold. One to sort of serve as the welcome to the board. This is how things operate. <laughs> and also sort of something that we can update probably on an annual cadence that just says, here's a snapshot of 
XYZ metrics in the district, such as unemployment or rats or whatever we would like to put in it. Is that what you were asking, Bill? <laughs> uh, yeah, basically, you know, a, a resource where we can actually tap into to find out information about the district. Okay. Yeah, uh, and, and honestly, I think one thing I'm hearing tonight is I think that we need to beef up our, our job board resources so that folks that live in the district that want to work in the district, like me, um, have a, a, a sort of a centralized place to go. Like we have a, a folder right now, but it's it's very, it's just a placeholder. Um, and I think we could work, again, when, when it's we and not me, um, we could be working more closely with, for example, like ask the bids to send us a roll up um, I know that the bids have to re are, are reporting to SBS what their um, you know storefront vacancy is, what what their employment numbers are, what kind of like how many employees they're employing in their cashment area. Maybe we ask them send us once a week a list of all of your small businesses that are hiring, right? There's much more we could do. Yeah, uh, Till, I actually requested that prior okay to the COVID, okay to have an update on a regular basis uh everything kind of went sideways put on hold so hopefully we can start that back up again but i was actually getting a report on a weekly basis uh in regards to unemployment numbers and the items of that you just discussed i think that's a great idea so it's like our local library so whenever we have questions or anything or look back at data you know, we can always go back to it. So I think that's a brilliant idea of you and Denise. And you, I know you're really good at putting stuff together, Tate, and being very organized. So. You know, it's, it's funny. I don't know if any of you know um, Alejandro Varela in the Hess Committee. He's a public member. Um, he, every single month, he makes a point of asking all of our liquor license application, applicants, how many employees do you expect to hire when you open this business? And how are you going to hire from our district? That gets asked every single month in, the, in our HES licensing committee. He's consistent with that. Yeah. Okay. And he's well, been like that even before um, we became virtual, even in person. I think in person has a bigger impact too because you're looking right in the face and they have to respond to it. Uh, is there anything it's else? Hard. It's interesting if we could find out how many people really followed up. That should be that would be an interesting question. How many people went to the different um, you know, facilities that he suggested? That would be really a good, interesting question. If we could really find out that. I have had that thought too, Latrell, and I was thinking I was trying to just extending on that, trying to figure out how to actually operationalize that. And what I realized is I think we have to be proactive the other way. I think we have to ask if you're opening a new business in our district that requires that you come to our board for a license, I think the final step of your application is sending us your job notices. That makes a good idea. That's a really good right. idea. And also when they come back, I mean, I don't know if it's a question that can be asked, but did, did they ask them, did you follow, did one of the things we asked you, did you, did you follow, it's not gonna be a standing whether or not you'll be with you or not, but you know, like, did you hire anybody for anything that we suggested? Hmm. You know, Latrell, you should bring that up at the HES committee at the next meeting. <laughs> okay. I didn't have to wait that long. She can call me anytime. <laughs> okay, with that. I saved it all for you, Bill. Uh, that's why I recommend it. <laughs> okay, so is there anything else? <laughs> okay, uh, down to nine, uh, item eight, community forum. Uh, community members who are not part of the board or for uh, the committee, uh, by all means, you have a moment to have a comment. Can I put Esther and Deborah on the spot? I'm, I'm just trying to, since we're not back in person quite yet, I just want to try and introduce folks to each other while we've got them. Um, Esther or Deborah, if you want to come off, um, come on camera and say hello, we'd love to meet you. Oh, no, I put them on the spot. I do not see any activity. 
as far as them unmuting themselves. So, no. Okay. Um, with that, there's no. I want everybody to think about coming out Saturday to see the two second annual health fair. And it's not just one committee, it's all committees that's been working on it from education to PAW to economic development to HES committee. So please come out. It's from 11 to 4. It's at Commodore Barry Park, excuse me. And if you want to come out and volunteer and help support, you're welcome to. But we just want to come out and hang out, you know, see your, see your former members of the board, you know. NYU is going to be here, Brooklyn Hospital. We're going to have a, um, a also, oh God, I can't even think of the name of uh, You know, we're going to have different doctors there. We're going to have stuff with kids. Um, some of the politicians are going to come out. So if you have a minute, you know, on Saturday, brothers begin in the middle of the end, come out and see. We're going to have AIDS testing. We're going to have blood pressure. Oh. Autistic, oh God, autistic. We have a panel on mental and internal health. Um, just come out. Okay, thank you, Taylor. Sorry, thank you, Latrell. Okay. Um, with that, uh, I'll over on item eight. I'll accept the motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. <laughs> thank you, Kate. Motion to adjourn. Yep. Thank All you, right. Mayor. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, we're, we're probably going to see each other one more time at the general meeting. But other than that, uh, enjoy your summer. Thank you. Good night. Thanks. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.